Now we've come to the mark of the beast. Does the mark of the beast have to do also with God's law in some way? Well, let's find out. Let's come back here now to, to Revelation 14, verse 9. If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark and his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And then look at verse 12, friends. After describing the mark of the beast and the forehead and the hand, he turns and says, here is the patience of the saints. After looking over now to those who had the mark of the beast and describing them, he turns the other way and says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. In other words, friends, the ones who had the mark of the beast were not keeping the commandments of God, obviously, because he turns right around to describe his own people, the saints, by saying, Here are they that keep the commandments of God. The others were not the ones with the mark of the beast. So this seems to indicate that the mark of the beast also has something to do with God's law. Well, it probably does because we're talking about two things that are competing with each other. They're in the same arena. They're diametrically opposed to each other, but they're still in the same arena in competition. Now, there's no competition between a, a, a railroad and a lumber yard, is there? But there is competition between a railroad and a bus line because they're operating in the same field. And these two things, my friends, that go into the forehead are operating in the same field. Both of them have to do with loyalty. Both of them have to do with, with the law of God. And so it has to do then with God's law, just like the seal had to do with God's law. Now, I want you to look at our list here for just a moment. Look at these ten points of identification. Notice point number eight. This power of the beast is going to try, remember, think to change. Think to change what? Times and laws, you see. Not only to change the law of God, but to change time as well. Now tell me, friends, where is time mentioned in the law of God? There's only one place that time is mentioned, and that's the fourth commandment. The fourth commandment that says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And the prophecy here is that the beast power is going to try to change time in the law. And that means that it's got to try to change the Sabbath commandment as well as the second one. Now, we found out that the second one was removed. But now here is the prediction that this power is going to try to change time as well as the law. And that would be tampering with God's seal, wouldn't it? Because we found out that the seal of God, the one commandment in the ten that sets him apart and identifies him as the true God, that's the Sabbath commandment. Well, don't you believe the devil would attack that one, my friends, that God used especially to identify himself and to claim the authority to be worshipped by all men? Don't you believe the devil would attack that one especially? And so the prophet says he's going to try to change God's time in the law. And so he attacked that fourth commandment. What does the fourth commandment say? The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Well, obviously, he has attacked it and done something to it because today most people don't keep the seventh-day Sabbath, do they? No, they don't. Then what happened? How did the devil attack that law and that particular commandment to try to change that particular time that's mentioned in the law? How did it happen? Surely back there in the days of the apostles, they were keeping the seventh-day Sabbath. We know that. The Bible makes that very pl plain. But there were other people, my friends, that were keeping a different day. And that was the pagan sun worshipers. They had their own day, you know. They worshiped the sun god. They were called Mithras back there in those days. And they had their own special day of worship, and they called it the venerable day of the sun. And they worshiped their sun god on that. Millions of those sun worshipers back there worshiped the sun god. And I'll tell you something else. There was a movement that developed after 200 A.D. Now, until 200 A.D., my friends, nobody kept any day but the Seventh-day Sabbath. All right? The Seventh-day Sabbath was observed right down 200 years after Christ. Then there began a movement to have one day a year to be observed in honor of the resurrection. All right, the Bishop of Rome wanted that day to be Sunday, the first day of the week. 
And it was to be observed just once during the year in honor of the resurrection. But all the other churches wanted it to come on the 16th of Nisan, which was the actual date in the Hebrew calendar for that, it, that the event took place. So they wanted to come on the 16th of Nisan, regardless of what day of the week it was, it was on. But the Bishop of Rome insisted that it be on a Sunday. And so, 200 years after Christ, the church set up one day a year on a Sunday, which came to be known Easter Sunday, that was to be kept in honor of the resurrection. It had nothing at all to do with the Sabbath. The Sabbath was kept right on anyway. Then time went on, and then Lent was added to the church. You know, the 40 days before Easter. And by the way, that came right in out of paganism. The 40 days of weeping for Tammuz, the, the god of the sun. But it came right into the church. And so the church decided that they wanted to keep every Sunday during that 40-year period. And so they made that rule, see? But still, it had nothing to do with the Sabbath. The seventh-day Sabbath continued to be observed right on as it had been by Christian people throughout those early years. Then we come down to the fourth century, 300 years after Christ. And at that time, they decided that they'd just keep every Sunday of the year in honor of the resurrection still had nothing to do with the seventh-day Sabbath. The Sabbath was observed, the seventh-day Sabbath, but they were keeping Sunday also in honor of the resurrection. So down to the third century, my friend, the fourth century, I mean, to 300 A.D., the Sabbath was observed, but slowly they came in with this, this Sunday to keep it in honor of the resurrection, but not competing with the Sabbath. They're trying to push the Sabbath aside. Now, what happened in 300? Let me tell you something else very interesting that happened. Constantine was the old pagan, sun-worshipping uh, emperor of the Roman Empire, and he was going out to fight a battle, the Battle of Milvian Bridge. And, and on the way, he thought he had a vision and saw a cross, a flaming cross up in the sky, and underneath it said, in this sign, conquer. And he thought that meant that he should be a Christian in order to win his battles. So what did he do? He marched his army through a river, and he said, now you're all Christians. You see, he had the idea that his army also would have to be uh, Christians in order to win the battles. So he marched them through a river and pronounced them all Christian. And he brought in all of these uh, pagans, uh, sun-worshipping pagans, into the church. Millions of them came into, at that time into the church. And my friends, Constantine made the first Sunday law. He made a secular law in the Roman Empire requiring everybody to keep the first day of the week instead of the seventh day of the week. And up to that time, they had all kept the Sabbath. He permitted certain occupations like farmers to continue at that time, but then later even that was set aside. And the Catholic Church adopted that. And in one church council after another, it became stronger and stronger that the first day of the week should be kept in place of the seventh. And, uh, and so a tremendous persecution broke out in trying to eliminate the seventh-day Sabbath. And friends, that is the way. That is the way Sunday got into church. You say, Brother Joe, I just can't believe that this is the way it happened, and I'm going to prove this to you. I don't want you to take my word tonight for any of this. You can read these things in history. But right now, let me read you a statement or so from uh, this, this first statement I'm going to read you is right out of a very authentic history book. It's Dr. Gilbert Murray, who's a professor of Greek at Oxford University. Now, this man has several doctor's degrees after his name. And this statement is taken from his book, History of Christianity in the Light of Modern Knowledge. He says, now since Mithras was the, the son, the unconquered, the religion looked for a king whom it could serve as a representative of Mithras upon earth. The Roman emperor seemed to be clearly indicated as the true king. In sharp contrast to Christianity, Mithraism recognized Caesar as the bearer of divine grace, and its worshipers filled the legions and the civil service. It had so much acceptance that it was able to impose on the Christian world its own Sunday in place of the Sabbath, the son's birthday, 25th December, is the birthday of Jesus. Now, here's this great Greek scholar who, as far as I know, is not even a Christian, but he's writing a history book. And he says that all of this paganism of Mithraism coming into the church had so much power and so much influence that it was able to impose on the world its own Sunday, its own day of worship, if you please, the venerable day of the sun when they worship the sun on the first day of the week, 
it was able to impose that upon the Christian world and also bring in the, its son's birthday, December 25th. And that is actually how it happened. I could read you statement after statement here. Dr. William Frederick says this in his book. He says the Gentiles were an idolatrous people who worshiped the sun. And Sunday was their most sacred day. Now, in order to reach the people in this new field, it seems but natural as well as necessary to make Sunday the rest day of the church. At this time, it was necessary for the church to either adopt the Gentiles' day or else have the Gentiles change their day. To change the Gentiles' day would have been an offense and stumbling block to them. The church could naturally reach them better by keeping their day. And so they did. They took in this pagan day of the sun that had been dedicated to the sun God and made it the worship day of the church. And the Sabbath was pushed aside. And the pagan day of the sun came in. Now you say, Brother Joe, are these facts? If it was not facts, my friends, I would not dare to speak these things tonight. But in order to give you greater evidence, I am now going to share with you some statements that will be utterly shocking and unbelievable to you. First of all, I'm going to read you another historical statement from another encyclopedia. I could read to you from the Encyclopedia Britannica. I could read you from Chambers Encyclopedia. Almost any of the older encyclopedias, you can read what I'm telling you tonight very clearly. It's in the pages of history. Chambers Encyclopedia says this, Unquestionably, the first law, either ecclesiastical or civil, by which the sabbatical observance of Sunday is known to have been ordained is the Sabbath Edict of Constantine, 321 A.D. So that tells us how that first Sunday law was put into operation. Now, friends, what I'm going to do is to turn to the Catholic Church. And you can read these statements for yourself as I read them here. And you will find some of the most astounding admissions made. These next few statements that I'm going to read to you are taken out of the official catechisms of the Church of Rome. Every one of them is an authentic statement out of one of the recognized catechisms that is published by the Catholic Church. I have most of these catechisms in my own library. You can check them out in any library you want to, and you'll find them exactly as I'm reading them. The first one is from uh, Peter Gierman's uh, catechism, the Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine. Question, which day is the Sabbath day? Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church and the Council of Laodicea transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Now, friends, the Catholic Church claims that they made the change. When that pagan day of the sun came in and Constantine made that first secular Sunday law, the church took it up and began to enforce it as a religious day. And so they claim we made the change. And these statements that I'm going to read to you now are the boast of the Catholic Church saying it's our work and we're the ones who made the change. This is from Henry Tuberville's catechism entitled An Abridgment of Christian Doctrine. How do you prove that the church had the power to change feasts and holy days? Answer, by the very act of changing Sabbath into Sunday, which Protestants allow of, and therefore they fondly contradict themselves by keeping Sunday strictly and breaking most other feasts commanded by the same church. Isn't that interesting? It says that they accept this law that we made about keeping Sunday, but they don't accept the other laws that we made about other feast days. This is a book by Father John Walsh, I have this book in my library. It was published in 1959. And here's what this catechism says. You can probably get this same book in a Catholic bookstore. Question, what obligation was imposed on the Israelites by the third commandment of God? Now, they call the third commandment, of course, the Sabbath commandment. Answer, the Jews were obliged to devote the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, to rest and religious observance. Question, does this commandment still remain in force? Answer, yes, it remains as operative today as it was in the time of the Israelites. One day each week must be set aside as sacred to God. But the Catholic Church transferred the observance from the seventh to the first day of the week. That was published in 1959 by the Catholic Church in which they said, we made the change. And the, 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 the day is now the first day instead of the seventh day because we so command. This is a doctrinal catechism by, by uh, Stephen Keenan. 
Question, have you any other way of proving that the church has the power to institute festivals of precept? Answer, had she not such power, she could not have done that in which all modern religionists agree with her. Notice that. In which all modern religionists agree with her. She could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day, a change for which there is no scriptural authority. The Catholic Church says if we didn't have authority and power to change God's law, then we could not have made the change of the Sabbath. And the world would not be keeping the first day if they had not accepted our authority and being able to make changes in God's law. This is another book that I have in my library, published in 1963, entitled Salvation, History, and the Commandments, published and written by a, 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 a Jesuit priest. Nothing is said in the Bible about the change of the Lord's Day from Saturday to Sunday. We know of the change only from the tradition of the church, a fact handed down to us from the earliest times by the living voice of the church. That is why we find so illogical the attitude of many non-Catholics who say they will believe nothing unless they can find it in the Bible and yet will continue to keep Sunday as the Lord's Day on the say-so of the Catholic Church. Now that's in my library, printed in 1963. The Catholic Church says what? We can't understand why Protestants keep, keep, continue to keep Sunday with only the authority of the Catholic Church behind it, nothing in the Bible about it, but they, they keep the day uh, on the say-so of the church, and yet they don't keep the other day, uh, festivals of the church. All right, here is another statement from uh, uh, John O'Brien's book, The Credentials of the Catholic Religion. This book is in all Catholic bookstores even today. I saw it not too long ago. You can get this book yourself, and here's what he says. But since Saturday, not Sunday, is specified in the Bible, isn't it curious that non-Catholics who profess to take their religion directly from the Bible and not from the church observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Yes, of course it's inconsistent. But this change was made about 15 centuries before Protestantism was born, and by that time the custom was universally observed. They have continued the custom even though it rests on the authority of the Catholic Church and not upon an explicit text in the Bible. That observance remains as a reminder of the mother church from which the non-Catholic sex broke away. Like a boy running away from home but still carrying in his pocket a picture of his mother and, or a lock of her hair. <laughs> I thought that was really interesting. The Protestants are keeping Sunday because they've run away from the Catholic Church. They've broken away from the Catholic Church, but they've taken along a little reminder of the Catholic Church by taking Sunday with them because that's something that we set up for them, and they took it along with them, and it reminds them of the Catholic Church from which they broke away. From the Catholic Press newspaper, Sunday is a Catholic institution, and its claims to observance can be defended only on Catholic principles. From the beginning to the end of Scripture, there is not a single passage that warrants a transfer of weekly public worship from the last day of the week to the first. Now, here is something I really want you to pay special attention to. This is a, a letter that was written by Cardinal Gibbons in response to a letter that came to him asking if the Catholic Church claimed the change of the Sabbath as her mark. Now, this is the letter that went to them, asking if, they, if that was their mark. And here's the answer he wrote back. Of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act. And the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. Now, there it is, friends. What did uh, Cardinal Gibbon say? He said, we change the Sabbath. And that is a mark of our authority and our power. My friends, what did God give as the mark of his religious power? The Sabbath. He gave the Sabbath. He said, this is the mark of my authority. I am the creator God. You're to worship me, and you're to follow me and obey me. The Catholic Church comes and says, no, we changed the Sabbath, and we're giving you Sunday, the first day of the week. And you keep that in recognition of our power and authority to even change God's law, you see. And my friends, unfortunately, the world follows the Catholic Church instead of following what God said. In fact, now let me read you a statement by a Catholic priest who was the president of Redemptorist College in St. Louis, uh, Kansas City, Missouri, rather, and here is an offer he made. Listen closely. 
He said, I have repeatedly offered $1,000 to anyone who can prove to me from the Bible alone that I'm bound to keep Sunday holy. There is no such law in the Bible. It is a law of the Holy Catholic Church alone. The Bible says, remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. The Catholic Church says, no, by my divine power I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep holy the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. What did the prophecy say that we read a moment ago, friends? That the whole world would do what? Follow the beast. That's what it said. Are they doing it tonight? Of course they are. They're following the beast. And this Catholic priest boasts of that. He said, God says keep the seventh day. We say keep the first day. And the whole world is following us, bowing down in reverent obedience to the Catholic Church. Now, friends, I want you to listen to something that is really hair-raising and startling and alarming. I'm going to read you now from the, from the statements of Protestantism. You say, Brother Joe, do Protestant churches understand the things that you presented here tonight? Do they know that the Sabbath is really the seventh day of the week and that the first day of the week is really not the day to be kept holy? Indeed, my friends, the great denominations of Protestantism have acknowledged this. And here are statements to prove it. Now, these things I'm going to read to you are taken right out of the very highest organs uh, of, uh, of publication in these churches. This is the Lutheran position, by the way. This is from the Augsburg Confession of Faith. And it says, The observance of the Lord's Day Sunday is founded not on any command of God, but on the authority of the church. The Lutheran Church says Sunday is not in the Bible. It comes from the church, not from the Bible. The Presbyterian position. This is from Dwight's theology. The Christian Sabbath Sunday is not in the Scripture and was not by the primitive church called the Sabbath. From the Congregational. This is from Fowler's book. There is no command in the Bible requiring us to observe the first day of the week as the Christian Sabbath. The Methodist position, this is Dr. Ben, Benny, Dr. Amos Benny's the, theological compendium. He says, it is true that there is no positive command for infant baptism, nor is there any for keeping holy the first day of the week. And the Methodist position, again, from Clovis Chapel. And here's a book you can get in any bookstore. I bought it not long ago myself. It's in my library. But Dr. Chapel says this, we ought to remember, this is in his book called Ten Rules for Living. We ought to remember that the Sabbath is God's gift to man. Notice he said the Sabbath is what? God's gift to man. We realize, of course, that our Sabbath is not the same as that observed by the Jews. Theirs was the seventh day of the week, while ours is the first. The reason we observe the first day instead of the seventh is based on no positive command. One will search the Scriptures in vain for authority for changing from the seventh day to the first. Our Christian Sabbath, therefore, is not a matter of positive command. It is a gift of the church. Now, Dr. Chapel, this great Methodist preacher, he says God gave the Sabbath. But he said the church gave the first day of the week. And it's not commanded in the Bible. It's a gift of the church, not a gift of God. The Episcopalian position, this is from Neander now, in his book, The History of the Christian Religion. The festival of Sunday, like all other festivals, was always only a human ordinance, and it was far from the intentions of the apostles to establish a divine command in this respect, far from them and from the early apostolic church to transfer the laws of the Sabbath to Sunday. And so the Episcopalians say that there was no change made by God or in the Bible. Dr. R. W. Dale, another congregational source, he said, it is quite clear that however rigidly or devotedly we may spend Sunday, we're not keeping Sabbath. The Sabbath was founded on a specific divine command. We can plead no such command for the observance of Sunday. There's not a single line in the New Testament to suggest that we incur any penalty by violating the supposed sanctity of Sunday. And now listen to this statement, one of the most amazing you've ever heard in your life by one of the greatest Baptist preachers who ever lived. Dr. Edward T. Hiscox is the author of the Baptist Manual. You'll find, in fact, in any Baptist bookstore, you'll find several manuals that he has written of Baptist doctrine. He says this. He says, There was and is a commandment to keep holy the Sabbath day, but that Sabbath day was not Sunday. It will be said, however, and with some show of triumph, that the Sabbath was transferred from the seventh to the first day of the week with all its duties, privileges, and sanctions. Earnestly desiring information on this subject, which I've studied for many years, I ask, 
Where can the record of such a transaction be found? Not in the New Testament, absolutely not. There is no scriptural evidence of the change of the Sabbath institution from the seventh to the first day of the week. Of course, he continues, I quite well know that Sunday did come into use in early Christian history as a religious day, as we learn from the Christian fathers and other sources. But what a pity that it comes branded with a mark of paganism and christened with the name of the sun god when adopted and sanctioned by the papal apostasy and bequeathed as a sacred legacy to Protestantism. Now, this great Baptist preacher has preached my whole sermon tonight in this one paragraph. He's given it all. He has said every single thing that I've told you tonight. He said Sunday is not in the Bible. It came from paganism, and it bears the mark of paganism. It was christened with the name of the sun god. I told you that. It was adopted and sanctioned by the papal apostasy. I proved that to you from the writings of Rome. And then it was bequeathed as a sacred legacy to Protestantism. And we know that happened because we see that it's here. It's being kept by them. It was passed on to them as a gift from Catholicism who got it from paganism. So, friends, there is my whole sermon tonight. Isn't that interesting? Now, in contrast to all of that, I point you to the seal of God, the commandment that God wrote with his own finger. He said, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the Sabbath day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. There's God's seal, my friends. And God says, if you keep this day, you're keeping what I bless, what I sanctified, what I commanded, and what I have set up as a divine memorial of my power and my authority. He said, keep that. Now we are going to add a tenth point to our long list of identifying marks concerning the little horn and the beast of Revelation 13. I want us to come down to the number of the beast. Now some of you, of course, have heard and read about the 666, haven't you? You know all about the 666. In fact, Revelation 13, 18. Listen to this statement now. In fact, I... I, th th this is so very fascinating for us. It says, Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is three, is six hundred, three score, and six. Six hundred, three score, and six. You've heard that, haven't you? Six, six, six. All right. Where does that number fit in here with this power we've just talked about? This says that it's a number of the beast. But it goes right on to say it is a number of a man. And the verse before this says it is a number of his name. All right, that's verse 17. Verse 17 says it's a number of his name. Verse 18 says it's a number of the beast and it's a number of a man. So when we put these three things together, what do we get? We get this, that it's the number of the name of the man that is ahead of the beast's power, see? Because it's ahead of the beast, it's the number of a man, and it's the number of a name. So that means it has to be the number of the name of the man who is the head of the beast's power. Well, of course, the pope is the head of that power. Well, you say, does he have a name then? And does that name have a number? Because we'd have to find that out and get that answer in order to know whether this text has been fulfilled or not in this, in this prophecy. Yes, friends, he does have a name, and it's an official name, really. It's in Latin. In fact, uh, that's the language of the church you know very well. And the name that has been given is vicarious filii dia. And that means vicar of the Son of God. Vicar of the Son of God. Now, friends, there was an ancient method of getting the number of a name, and that was to get the numerical value of every letter in that name and then adding it up in order to get the sum, which would be the number of the name. And uh, as our audience here can see on the screen, the number of that name is vicarious filii dei. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to get the number of that name. Each letter 
has a numerical value according to Roman numerals. You folk understand that very well. And so V, vicarious is spelled V-I-C-A-R-I-U-S, Philii, F-I-L-I-I, D-I-D-E-I. Now let's get the number of the name. Let's add up the numerical value of all those letters. In the Roman numerals, V is what? That's five, isn't it? So V is five. I is one, C is a hundred, A and R have no value. Some letters don't have any value in the Roman numerals. And then I is one, and then the U and the V are all the same thing in Roman numerals, so that would be five again. S has no value. Philia, F-I-L-I-I, -I. F has no value. I is one, L is fifty, I is one, I is one. And then D, I, D, E, I, D is 500, E has no value, I is 1. Now when we add all of that together, friends, we get 666. Six, six. And that's a number of his name. Now it's very interesting, at one time that actual Latin title appeared on the mitre of the Pope's crown. It is no longer there. But every time a new pope is coronated, those words are spoken. Vicarious filiadia, which means vicar or representative of the Son of God on earth. And so the official name then, we found the number of it, 666. You might say, well, Brother Joe, you know, maybe your name or my name might accidentally come out to be that if we added up the, the numerical value of the letters. Yes, that is altogether possible, friends, and that's why I only add this as a tenth point of identity down here at the end of our other nine points. You see, if we only had that one point, we wouldn't even use it. It might be indeed a coincidence. But it's almost as though we had everything else about this power, and now we get the final uh, crowning climax of evidence. It's almost like you're looking for a house on a certain street. You know the name of the street. You know the color of the house. You know the kind of roof it has and the kind of windows it has, but then somebody gives you the number of the house, and that pins it down finally. You really know then exactly wh what, where the house is. And so what we've added here is a great uh, crowning bit of evidence, my friends, that shows that we're right as we have put these points before you concerning the identity of this beast and the little horn power. Now, friends, we're going to do something very, very interesting we're going to turn to look at our beast for a moment. Please notice something here interesting. Look at the beast. Do you notice the combination? It has the body of the leopard, the feet of the bear, the mouth, and the heads and the crowns and so forth here. This beast, which we have now identified without any question, I don't believe anybody can say, well, Brother Joe, you've, you've not really proven that point. These points over here prove without question that this is indeed the papacy. Now, Notice this beast is made up of the four beasts of Daniel 7. It has the body of the leopard beast, the feet of the bear, the mouth of the lion, and the ten horns of the fourth beast. Why does God represent this modern religious system that we have clearly identified tonight as the papacy? Why does God represent that as being made up of these old pagan kingdoms of Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome? I'll tell you why, friends, because when it was formed, it drew much of its doctrine and philosophy and teaching out of paganism. And we've given some examples of that already in the past messages. But there was a counterfeit system set up. And instead of the Word of God, it was tradition. Instead of the Holy Spirit, it was the Pope. Instead of the one sacrifice of Christ, it was the Mass. Instead of communion, it was transubstantiation. Instead of baptism, it was sprinkling. Instead of the eternal law of God, it was a changed law. Instead of tithes, it was taxes and indulgences. Instead of death, it was purgatory. Instead of the seal of God, it was the mark of the beast. Now, we're not going to deal with all of those counterfeits here today. We're only going to look at that last one, the seal of God and the mark of the beast because these two things are in competition with each other according to the Bible. So let's turn now and think of this for a moment. The mark of the beast, what is it? 
Well, friends, it is something opposed to the seal of God. Did you know in the book of Revelation that two things are spoken of as going into the forehead? You know, of course, that the mark of the beast goes on the forehead. We read that a moment ago. In, in Revelation 14, 9, and 10, in fact, maybe we'll just drop back there quickly to point this out once more, the text that we opened with today. But it says, If any man worship the beast and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, now, here is a mark of loyalty and allegiance to the beast power. But did you know in chapter 7 of Revelation, it speaks about the seal of God, the mark of God going into the forehead also? Many people don't understand this. Go back with me now to chapter 7 of Revelation and look at verses uh, 2 and 3. And I saw another angel ascending from the east having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. Now there it is. God has a mark that he puts in the forehead. The beast power has a mark that he puts in the forehead. One of them, a mark of loyalty to God. The other one, a mark of loyalty to the beast power. And these two things are competing with each other. They're in the same arena. They're diametrically opposed to each other. Now, what are they, friends? First of all, let's find out what the seal of God is, and then that will help us understand what the mark of the beast is because they're connected. They're related to each other. What about a seal? What is a seal? Many of you folk know, of course, that it has to do with legal matters. It's something that gives authority to something, isn't it? It shows authority. All legal documents have to have that seal. In fact, all the laws that are passed by this government have the official seal of the United States placed upon it to show that this is authoritative. This is legal. And a seal always has three things, all right? It has the name of the authority, the title of the authority, and the territory of the authority. For example, the President of the United States. He has his own seal. And it is Ronald Reagan, President, United States of America. And if you've seen that in some of the news uh, cast and uh, the uh, news interviews, there it was in the background, the great seal of the President of the United States of America. And even a little notary public has the same thing. He's got to have those three required uh, characteristics in his seal. The name, the office or title, and the territory. So remember that, that the seal has to do with legal matters, and it shows authority, and it has these three required things in it, the name, the office, and the territory. Now, friends, let me ask you this question. Does God's great seal have to do with his great legal document? In other words, now all legal documents have to, have to be sealed. And so I'm asking, does God's great legal document, his law, does, is it related to the seal of God? Come back with me now to Isaiah chapter 8, and I'm reading verse 16. Listen to this. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. Now here God's seal is connected with his law. Well, of course, we just found out that seals have to do with legal matters, legal documents. And here's God's legal documents, document, and it says, Seal the law among my disciples. Now, friends, listen. Under the new covenant, where does God place his law? You remember over here now in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament? Where does God put his law? Listen to this. Listen to this. For this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. Verse 10 of Hebrews 8. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. See, friends, God's law is put right here in the mind. You see, you keep the law with your mind and your decision and your choice. And you keep it with your hand also, don't you? You keep it physically and you obey it spiritually. That's the way you do it. God says, I'm going to put my law into their minds or into the forehead here. Now, please drop back to Exodus 13 for a very, very interesting statement here in verse 9. Exodus 13, verse 9. 
And it shall be for a sign unto thee. It shall be for what? A what? A sign unto thee upon thine hand and for a memorial between thine eyes that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth. Now here he speaks of the law as being put between the eyes. Well, that's right on the forehead, isn't it? And he's going to write it where? In the mind. And he's going to put it in the hand. God's law is spoken of as being bound to the hand because we obey it physically and keep it physically. And then it's spoken of as being put between the eyes, upon the forehead, in the mind, because people obey it spiritually as well as physically. So here we have then God's law, the seal, and we found it said seal the law, so God's seal is connected with it, and the seal is going into the forehead. We read in Revelation the seal would go into the forehead. The law goes into the forehead. Now, before we try to identify, friends, the seal in the law, because the seal's got to be there somewhere, and we're going to look for it in a moment. Let me ask this question. What constitutes a person's authority? For example, now let's think of the President of the United States. What, what position does he hold by virtue of which he claims authority? He has an office, doesn't he? He holds a position. And by virtue of that position, he claims certain powers and certain authority. And that position is what? The President of the United States of America. And by virtue of that, he claims the authority that is vested in him. All right, now we need to understand that very, very closely. Now, if God has a seal, what is his position? What is his office, if you please, by virtue of which he claims authority over the earth? Why, friends, he's the creator, isn't he? He's the creator God. And all through the Bible, God makes the special claim. He says, I'm the true God. I'm the only one to be worshipped. I'm the one who made the heavens and the earth and set everything in motion that exists. Now, let's turn and read a few texts like this that are really exciting. For example, in Jeremiah 10, Jeremiah chapter 10, and I'm reading there verse 10 and then verse 11. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and everlasting King. At His wrath the earth shall tremble and the nation shall not be able to abide His indignations. Thus shall ye say unto them, The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. He hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom and has stretched out the heavens by his discretion. Now he compares himself or contrasts himself with the other gods. He said the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, they're nothing. They're idols. But I'm the creator God. I'm the one to be worshipped. And this distinguishes me and sets me apart as the only one to be worshipped. Come back into the book of Isaiah now, chapter 40. And we notice there very similar claims that God makes. Chapter 40 of Isaiah, and then verses 25 and 26 and 28. To whom then will ye liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things, that bringeth out their host by number? Verse 28, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not? Oh, he said, I'm the one that rules the universe. I'm the one who has power and authority over the universe because I have made it and I'm not to be compared with any other. I'm not equal to any other because I have made all of these things. And then we turn the page there to chapter 42 of Isaiah. Thus, and verse 5, Thus saith God the Lord, He that created the heavens and stretched them out, He that spread forth the earth, and that which cometh out of it, He that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and spirit to them that walk therein. And verse 8, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another. And then coming on down to chapter 40, uh, 44 and verse 6, uh, or rather, uh, let's come down to, to verse 24. Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretch forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. 
And Isaiah 45, verse 12, I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens, and all their host have I commanded. So over and over again, God says, I'm the true God. You're to worship me because I made everything that was made. Look at Psalm 90, 90, uh, uh, 96. Psalms 96 and verse 5. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. You get that again? He's comparing himself now or contrasting himself with the idols. He says, I made the heavens and all the other gods, they're idols. And then one more text here. Come to Revelation 4 and verse 11. Revelation 4, 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things. Now listen, what makes God worthy of honor, my friends, to be worshipped and to be acknowledged and recognized? He's the creator God. He made us. He gave life to everything. Not any other God has been able to do that. And so God boasts of that. These are his divine credentials. He said, I've done this. The other gods cannot do this at all. I'm the one to be worshipped. Now friends, listen. After he made the heavens and the earth, what sign did he give the world as evidence that he was the creator alone? What did he set up as a memorial or a divine reminder of his power as the creator of the heavens and the earth? Well, you know that in Genesis 2 and verses 1, 2, and 3. Listen. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Listen, he gave the Sabbath as a great sign of his creative power. He said every time the seventh day comes around in every city and village and hamlet and the world, as the seventh-day Sabbath travels around the world and comes to every town and every city, it will remind the, the world, he said, that I am the creator God. I'm giving you the Sabbath so that you will always remember. Remember, I'm the one to be worshipped. I'm the one who made everything and everybody. And the Sabbath will be my sign. And when you keep the Sabbath, you will know that I'm the only God to be recognized and to be worshipped. What a tremendous thing. Now, with this little background, folks, let me ask the question, where do we find God's seal in his law? Now, remember, it has to be connected with his law. We read a moment ago in Isaiah, seal the law among my disciples. So the seal is connected with the law, and it has to be something that is his signature. It gives credentials to him. It gives authority to him. Come with me now to the Ten Commandments as they're written in Exodus 20. Exodus chapter 20, and we're going to read here now beginning in verse, uh, in verse 3. This is the first commandment of the ten. And here's what it says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now what are we looking for, friends? What are the three things in a seal that makes it authentic? The name, the office, and the territory. Three things, and that's a requirement for a true seal. Now, we don't find his name or his office or his territory in the first commandment. So let's go to the next one. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that's in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Now, here you have his name, but you don't have his office or his territory. So we move on to the third commandment. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Now here we have his name given to us again, but not his title or his territory. So we move to the next commandment. Verse 8, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth to see and all that in them. Friends, here it is. Right in the very heart of God's great moral law, he puts the three things that constitute a seal. His name is here. His title or office is here the maker, the creator, 
and his territories here, the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. In other words, actually, friends, God adds his signature here to his law. Without this fourth commandment, any other God could come along and say, well, that's my law. I believe the same thing. That's describing me. I'm the author of that law. But God said, no, I'm going to put my signature in there that will set me apart as the only one who can be recognized as, a, as the giver of that law. He said, there in the fourth commandment, I am the creator of the heavens and the earth and everything that was made. And I'm the only God that meets this, uh, this description. And so, friends, there is God's seal. That's what shows his authority. That's what puts him in a position, my friends, of power and of authority and of recognition by all mankind. He is the true God. And so the seal of God then, friends, is the Sabbath. The Sabbath, the only commandment that has it, seal the law among my disciples. Now you may say, well, Brother Joe, is there any other text in the Bible that would indicate that the Sabbath is God's seal? Yes, turn with me now to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 20, and I'm reading verse 12. Moreover, also, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I'm the Lord that sanctified them. Now, here's something interesting. God calls the Sabbath here his sign. Well, you say, Brother Joe, that's not, that's not seal. That's not the same as a seal. But, folks, it really is. You see, these words sign and seal are used interchangeably in the Bible. Did you know that? Come with me to Romans 4 now, verse 11, and let's read the text that proves this. Romans 4, verse 11. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had. Notice that sign and seal are the same thing. They're used interchangeably in the Bible. And so when God said, the Sabbath is my sign, he was really saying, the Sabbath is my seal. And it's the only one of the commandments that has the three required characteristics of a true seal. And it's used in connection with his law, his great legal document, and it shows that he is the only authority.